It's a beautiful day that the Lord has made and set aside for us to be here this morning. We have a good crowd. We're grateful for all of our visitors. Some of you are really not visitors. You're just coming home, and it's good to see you. Let's begin with a prayer. Our Father, we're thankful indeed for this day that you granted unto us an opportunity, Father, to come together as your church to assemble in the truth and the spirit and to recognize, Father, the importance of this day as a remembrance of your death, burial, and resurrection. Father, we enjoy this moment every Sunday because every Sunday for us is Easter. Bless us in this time, Father, now of Bible study. We pray that you will direct our thoughts. Thank you, Father, indeed, for your Son who came to this world and who lived and died for our sins. Help us, Father, to, to come to Thee and to do what the Bible commands in order to relieve ourselves of the guilt and the death of sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love the spree. You know, we've had three months, maybe three, four months. Not too bad weather, but still, it's been kind of gloomy. Everything's dead. Grass is dead. Trees are dead. Can't do a lot of fishing. So things is kind of bad in those winter months. Moments of cold. But then comes spring. The new growth. We look around, we see the trees starting to adorn themselves with the leaves of spring and the colors. We watch the new growth as it begins to sprout from the earth. It's a beautiful time of the year. Plus, I get to go fishing. <laughs> as we think about that, not fishing, but as we think about the time of the year that it is in spring, I have a quote from a fellow by the name of Mark Twain. Now, I think we would appreciate this quote. Mr. Twain said, In the spring, I have counted 136 different kinds of weather, and it's all been within 24 hours. That's the way it is right now in the spring, especially here in Texas. We want to talk about new growth. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark 4, verse 26. Mark 4, verse 26. As we look around and we see this new growth as it's happening everywhere around us, it's interesting the way it takes place. I love what Jesus said in Mark 4. The kingdom of God is as a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day. And the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. That's the way it is. This growth that we experience in nature. We sleep and we wake up and it's almost as if it's grown a little bit. We see it begin to push through the earth. We see it begin to, to take uh, shape and, and the blade and the head begins to, to come up and won't be long it'll be the mature plant. There is growth. And this morning I want to look at growth in several different areas, several different ways. First of all, we have to understand who created life. You are here today because of God. God is the giver of all life. In Acts 17, verse 25, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things. Every time you breathe, think about God. Because every breath is from God. Your existence is from God. 
First Timothy 6, verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. You know, there is a sanctity to all life. And we need to respect that sanctity. Especially the life of men because he breathed within us the spirit of Jehovah, his life. And we share in that life. Now, as we think about that, we have to realize something. Before there can be life, there has to be death. You know, I, I'm not an agronomist. I don't even hardly know what that word means. But I do know a little bit about nature. I remember some things in science. One of the things I remember hearing that really shocked me is that when you plant the seed, before that seed sprouts, it must die. And you know, science didn't figure that out on its own. Jesus said that in John 12, verse 24. I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. It remains alone. It just dies. It disintegrates of no use. But if it dies, then it sprouts and it bears fruit a hundredfold. You know, I think about this quite a bit. You think about an apple tree. You think about all of the apple trees that is represented in that one apple tree. All the seeds in those apples. Each seed represents what could be a tree. But of course it has to be planted. And then when it's planted, we find out it has to die. Before there can be an apple tree, there has to be a dead seed in the earth. And then it sprouts. I have an oak tree here at my house, and you ought to see all the little oak sprouts coming up from it, and the tree's been cut down. You see, that's life. And that life comes from death. And unless it dies, Jesus tells us, it cannot bear fruit. If it bears fruit, it's not alone. If it does not bear fruit, then it remains alone. 2,000 years ago, there was a man who walked the streets of Jerusalem, who lived among men, and then because of hatred and jealousy, envy, and because he was different, he was put to death. He alone, outside of the two miscreants that was crucified with him, Jesus stood on that cross when he could. He'd lift his body up in a standing position, but not. He would just give in to it for six hours, and then he died. That was over 2,000 years ago. And I want you to look around you right now. This is the fruit of that man's death. And until he returns, his death will continue to bear fruit. Had he not died, there would have been no fruit gathered for the Father. But voluntarily, he gave his life. Now that ought to mean something to us. We understand what a volunteer is. Jesus said, well, they took him. No, he took him by force, but notice something. He gave himself to them. Then when the disciples wanted to fight, he would put up your sword. He healed the ear of Malchus, who just had it lopped off by Peter. That's not what this is all about. That was the reason he came to this world, was to die for you and for me. And through that death, he has borne the fruits which we're a part of. Now, that in turn gives us another situation that we have to deal with. Before we can live and bear fruit, 
we ourselves must die. The problem is we're too fond of this life. We get too connected to this life. We get too connected to the things of this world, to the passions of this world. And it draws us in. And we don't want to die to it. We want to live in it. And if we live in it, it removes us from Christ. If we don't die to that old man, the old man of sin, the old man of death, if we don't die to the passions of this world, to the things of this world, then we'll never live with Christ. So we have to die. Turn to the book of Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Look at verses 1 through 5. Now notice the question that Paul begins with. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You see, they were saying, well, since God's grace is so strong and prevalent in Christianity, therefore the more we sin, the more God's grace is poured out upon us. Paul says, what what kind of rationality is that? What kind of thinking is that? Notice what he goes on to say, starting in verse 2. Certainly not. How shall we who, what, died to sin live any longer therein? Do you not know that many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ? And we no longer live in that sin. We were let out into Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. I want you to notice something about this. And I'm going to stop right here. We are baptized into Christ, and we are baptized into his death. In baptism, we become partners with Christ in death. We die. You know that old man of sin, that old man that is tainted by the, by the stench of sin? He's gone. He's been washed. He's been justified, cleansed through the blood of Christ. And now we become partners with Christ. Partners in his death. Before we can live with Christ, before we can walk in newness of life, we've got to die. The spiritual death. Now understand, there's a death that awaits each and every one of us. That's the death, the physical death. The physical death where our spirit will be separated from this body and this spirit will go on into judgment. How we live this life determines where we will spend our eternity. You know, a lot of you have seen this illustration of you. Some of you have not. But if I were to take just one point on this screen, just one little small point, Pixel, I think they call them. Just take one pixel on that screen. That would not even be close to represent this time on earth compared to eternity. And yet people are willing to sacrifice an eternity for a little bit of time of pleasure on this earth. Go figure. Unless we die, we can't live. And we cannot bear fruit. Notice what Paul said. And we walk in the newness of life. A new creation. And like Rick said this morning in Bible class, we are a person now that shows the difference. If we are truly dead in Christ, then our life is going to be different. We'll be living differently. And it's going to be manifested to those that surround us. They're going to see the difference. 
If they can't see the difference, have we really died? Second Corinthians 5 verse 17, we've been raised to walk in that newness of life. A new creation, he said in 517. A new creation. We find out here the old man has been put to death in the waters of baptism. If we are not dead in Christ, we are worldly and dead to Christ. That's the only two positions that there is. We're either dead in Christ or dead to Christ. If we're dead in Christ, we're dead to the world, but alive in Christ. If we have been baptized into Christ Jesus, we've, we've washed those sins away, Acts 22, verse 16, then we are in Christ, Galatians 3, 27. As a result of that, we are now dead to the world, alive in Christ Jesus. So before there can be life, there must be death. I now want to talk, we talked about the new growth, now I want to talk about the you growth. Some people look at the, the plan of salvation that God gives to us in the Bible as kind of formula, a formulary. Just we X this box and X this box and X this box and X this box and then we call ourselves Christians. There's so much more. So much more. You see, it's not just formulary. Number one, why do we obey the commands? Well, I don't want to go to hell. Well, that could be one reason, but is that it? Fear? I want to go to heaven. Okay, that's great. So you wanting something for your obedience? I love God. Now we're in the picture. You see, too many times we'll be in the scheme of redemption and the plan of salvation out of the wrong motives. Those motives are part of it, yes, indeed. But folks, it has to be because of the love. There's our motivation. Rick talked about that this morning. And that is so important. That's what manifests our love to God when he sees our obedience to him. To be born again is a mechanism of new birth. John 3, verse 5. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Unless a man be born of water and of spirit, he shall in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. In Acts 8, verse 36, as Philip was riding with the eunuch in the chariot, he had been teaching him Jesus. And the Bible said that they passed by water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? The, the Philip said, Nothing if you believe. He said, I believe. And so he took him down in the water and Philip baptized him. Why did he baptize him? Because of his faith. And because he'd been taught that he was in baptism, that he would put on Christ. And the Bible said he walked away rejoicing. But notice, let's go back to John 3, 5. What is the water of John 3, verse 5? It's water. What it says it is. Growth involves water. And in fact, in Romans chapter 6, we find out our death involved that water. First 3, 3, 20, verse 21. And I figured that baptism also now saved us. Verse 20, back up, and it says, As many as eight souls were saved by water. Then he said, and I figure, what figure? Saved by water. And I figure that baptism also now save us. Not the putting of the filth of flesh, but an answer to good conscience toward God. It's not just a dunking, folks. There's a purpose, a God-given purpose in baptism. And that's the new life, the new growth, the washing away of our sins. In Acts 22, verse 16, we are saved by the washing away of our sins. 
Now the Spirit, turn to 1 Peter 1.23. 1 Peter 1.23. Peter talks about the new birth. Having been born again. Are you a born again Christian? If you are, this is how it happened. Not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now Peter tells us part of this new birth not only involves the water that Jesus talked about, but Jesus also talked about the spirit. And Peter tells us what that spirit is. It's the word of God. We're born again by the word of God. Now let's tie both of them together. In Ephesians 5 and verse 26. We're saved by the washing of water with the word. That's the new birth. And if you've been washed with water by the word, you've been born again. I never will forget, I was at a McDonald's in Waxahachie, Texas. And a young lady walked up to me, just out of the clear blue, and, and uh, told me who she was. And then she said, are you born again? I said, yes, I am. She said, good, good. I said, now, do you know how we're born again? Well, sure, you believe. Yes, we do. Boy, you have to believe. You know those folks in Acts 2? They believed. And because of that belief, they were told to finish it off. Repent and be baptized. You've got to get out of the sinning business. God cannot tolerate sin. Therefore, we have got to get out of the sinning business when we become a Christian. And what we do with the past sins is we wash them in baptism. Washed away. And it's such a wonderful experience to feel God's forgiveness and then to escape that darkness that's in the world. So we're born again. We're washed in the blood. You know, we see blood as a sticky, ooey, red-colored stuff. We certainly do not want it to get on us. In fact, under the law, blood was considered unclean. But you know, there's a verse in the Bible that says that God gave us that blood, and that blood represents life. A lot of times it represents death to us, but to God it represents life. Therefore, the sacrifices that was offered in the old law represented life. The death of Christ, the blood he shed, represented life. And it represents the cleansing power. In Revelation 1 and verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from sin with his own blood. All of a sudden, blood takes on a different feel now, doesn't it? Because it's that blood that cleanses us. And by the way, it says we've been washed in the blood. There's a connectivity between that word washing and blood and baptism. Now this sermon really wasn't going to be on baptism, but you've got to understand something. How significant that is to the cleansing of our souls and to this new growth that we experience. Without the shedding of blood, Hebrews 9 verse 22, there is no remission of sins. There's no salvation. Jesus had to die. That blood had to be shed. And we have to wash ourselves, cleanse ourselves in that pool of blood. Our robes are made white through washing them in the blood of the Lamb. Now that doesn't make much sense, does it? How hard is it, ladies, to get blood out of a garment, especially a white garment? And yet, 
Our robes as Christians are made white through the blood of Christ. Pure, sanctified, clean. You know, that represents what we'll be wearing in heaven. If we live this clean, sanctified, pure, holy life on this earth, that's what we'll be wearing in heaven. Robes washed by the blood of the Lamb. As a Christian has died and been separated from the world, he now produces fruit. Turn to John 15. This is going to be our closing remarks. John 15. In John 15, Jesus gave one of the great I Am passages. There are seven I Am passages. Again, I am represented the deity of Christ. I am. He had no beginning. He had no end. He is eternal with the Father. Physically, when he has subjected himself to the flesh, yes, he did have a beginning and an end. But in the image of God, he had no beginning and no end. He is eternal. In John 15, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, Turn to verse 4. Verse 4. Read with me if you would. Abide in me. Stay in me. Remain faithful in me. And I will remain in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Galatians 5 talks about the fruits of the Spirit. When you look at that fruit, that fruit is determined by Christ abiding in us and we in Him. If we're not abiding, abiding in Him, we can't bear those spiritual fruits because this is a spiritual abiding. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out of the branch and withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. He's useless. You know, if you have a fruit tree, and that fruit tree has a barren limb on it, what do you do with it? You take, cut that limb off, because it's just taking, it's just zapping the nourishment from that vine, from that tree. And you take it and burn it. Now watch this in verse 7. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, now watch this, that you bear much fruit. Now I want to tie this together. 2,000 years ago as Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came for the express purpose of finishing the will of God and bearing fruit. And he has borne fruit for 2,000 years through his death. We experience that fruit. We are part of that fruit. Being a part of that fruit, we are the seed. Now we have sprouted if we are Christians and if we have been washed in the blood of Christ. And now it is up to us to bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. The fruit of others being brought to Christ through our relationship with them and by our demeanor, by our behavior. That they may see our and be influenced by our example. But also taking the word to others. It's amazing sometimes the way we see we can talk to others about anything under the sun, but we have a hard time talking about God's Son. And then, of course, we bear the fruits that's worthy of repentance. This morning, 
you're a Christian, you are new and improved. You're no longer caught in the clutches of sin and death. You've been released from the bonds of hell. And now you stand before Christ pure and clean and holy. Now we bear fruit with Christ. You know, we look at each other and we realize that, okay, Christ has borne fruit for 2,000 years. But you know what? Man has to bear fruit in order for this to happen because look here. How did you hear about the gospel? You heard it from somebody. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was your grandparents. Maybe it was your friends. Maybe your husband or wife. But somebody had to tell you the gospel. They had to share it with you. So, this morning we're all here by the love of Christ by the power of the gospel, Romans 1 verse 16, and because someone took the time to share the gospel with us. That's the way it works. That's the way God intends for it to work. This morning, we have shared the gospel together. There may be somebody here who has of yet repented of the sins that you've committed in the past and been baptized, born again to start fresh. Do you remember as kids the do-overs? And golf is called mulligans. The do-over. Well, I'm going to do that one over. Okay, we'll give you one do-over. God's given us a do-over through Jesus Christ. We can start over. I don't care what we've done. Here was a murderer. A man involved in taking the lives of people just because they believed in Jesus Christ and yet Christ forgave him. And if he can forgive Saul of Tarsus who became Paul the Apostle, he can forgive any of us. No matter what we've done, who we are, where we are in our lives. Thank God for that kind of love. We just have to submit to Him. Submit to His love through our obedience. This morning, if you've never done that, I want you to consider where you stand in light of eternity. And if we can help you tonight, or this morning, let us help you. Find your way to the Father through repentance, through faith, through baptism, through confession. Sometimes as Christians, we blow it. We blow it. We sin because we're human. But we serve a God of forgiveness again. Remember that. And by confessing that sin, praying over it, we can be forgiven. If you need to come, we encourage you to do so. Always stand and sing together. Thank you.